and uh, so good morning to everyone uh, joining from india and uh, hello to attendees from other parts of the world uh, good evening uh, to professor hinton i know it's quite late in the evening for you uh, we really appreciate you joining so uh, so we start the third day of the cords coma 2021 conference uh, with this much awaited keynote talk by professor g of hinton my name is shaurya roy uh, i'm a co general chair of the conference and also i have the pleasure of doing the introduction for this keynote so before i do so um, i would like to express uh, our sincere thanks to dr vinod nayar uh, a former student of professor hinton uh, for helping the conference organizing committee to do the connection with him and to make this talk happen uh, okay um now coming to the introduction uh, geoffrey hinton uh, received his phd in artificial intelligence from edinburgh in 1978 After five years as a faculty member at Carnegie Mellon, he became a fellow of the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research and moved to the Department of Computer Science at the University of Toronto, where he is now an emeritus professor. He is also a VP Engineering Fellow at Google and Chief Scientific Advisor at the Vector Institute. Geoffrey Hinton was one of the researchers who introduced the backpropagation algorithm. and the first to use back propagation for learning word embeddings his other contributions to neural network research include boltzmann machines distributed representations time delay neural nets mixtures of experts variational learning and deep learning his research group in toronto made major breakthroughs in deep learning that revolutionized speech recognition and object classification Geoffrey Hinton is a fellow of the UK Royal Society and a foreign member of the US National Academy of Engineering and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. His awards include the David E Rummelhart Prize, the Ichkai Award for Research Excellence, the Killam Prize for Engineering, the IEEE Frank Rosenblatt Medal, the NSERC Herzberg Gold Medal, and the IEEE James Clerk Maxwell Gold Medal. the nec cnc award the bbva award the honda prize and the turing award with that an absolute honor i welcome professor hinton to deliver his keynote talk thank, thank you thank you thank you very much for your introduction what i'm going to talk about today is quite complicated i was told i could talk about anything i liked so i'm going to talk about what i'm currently thinking about And what I'm going to do is take three recent advances in neural network research, and show how those advances can be combined to create a new type of vision system that's much more like human perception. Now, right up front, I want to admit I haven't actually built this vision system yet. Um, it's just imaginary, um, but it's obvious to me that it will work, and therefore it stands a small chance of working. I want to start by convincing you about the psychological reality. of the part whole hierarchy in human perception and coordinate frames in human perception people think coordinate frames are just to do with when you do cartesian geometry but there's lots of evidence that people use them and in the next seven slides i'm going to try and convince you of that so i'm going to start with the demonstration and this is something i want you all to do to actually do the demonstration you imagine a wireframe cube and it's resting on a tabletop in front of you and you imagine the body diagonal that goes from the front bottom right hand corner through the middle of the cube to the top back left corner and then keeping the front bottom right corner on the table you move the top back left corner until it's vertically above the front bottom right corner now keeping your fingertip where the top corner is with your other hand just point to where the other corners of the cube are not the one on the table the sort of where the other ones are and i want you to actually do it and when you actually do it you suddenly realize you haven't got a clue um and a cube's not that complicated an object i'll tell you what most people do most people do this they they have their top top hand there and they say they here 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 and here they point them out in a square and then you ask them count how many corners a cube has it's got eight corners so what happened to the other two Because you only point out four. For those of you who are wondering, I have a cube here. This is a very old cube, and you can see the corners. The are in a zigzag ring. Those purple edges connect all the corners, 
the three edges come down from the top, three edges come up from the bottom, and you get that zigzag ring. Now the point is, you didn't know a cube had that structure. That's a completely different way of thinking about a cube. Um, I actually have a picture of them there. So the other edges of a cube form a ring like that. And now I'm going to show you that there's many ways of looking at that ring. So the way I've colored it now with green and blue and red, you can see that the edges form three triangular flaps and each triangular flap so it slopes upwards and outwards. Okay. But I could color it a different way. So now there's a green flap that slopes up, a central rectangle and a red flap that slopes down. And if I were to take that image away and say, how many parallel lines are there in the image? Most people would say two, those two blue lines are obviously parallel. And they're not aware that one of the red lines and one of the green lines are parallel. And that's because those lines don't line up with the rectangular coordinate frame. You're using a coordinate frame for the triangles where those are diagonal lines and you just don't notice that they're parallel. They're in different parts and they don't line up with the coordinate frame. So what's happening is the very same arrangement of rods can be understood in completely different ways by a person. And when they understand it one way, they know some things about it that they don't know when they understand a different way. It's not like a Necker cube where you see two different structures in 3D that are different from one another when the Necker cube flips. Here, you don't see anything different. The two people who see it two different ways don't disagree on anything. They're just parsing it differently and they're aware of completely different things, but it's the same reality. So you might represent the interpretation with three triangular flaps that slope upwards and outwards by a little structural description like this. The whole thing's a crown. There's those three flaps and each flap has two parts. And on the arcs, you might put the spatial relationship between an intrinsic frame of reference embedded in the crown and an intrinsic frame of reference embedded in one of the flaps. Or between the intrinsic frame of reference of a flap and the intrinsic frame of reference of one of the edges. So, that's the kind of structural description I'll be talking about when I talk about parsing scenes. Um, it's a little graph that describes the structure of the scene. And of course, the same scene can be described differently. So here's a graph for the zigzag, where the edges are grouped differently. And you perceive it as a flap sloping up at one end, a rectangle in the middle, a flap sloping down at the other end. Now, those just describe the structure of what's in the scene, but don't tell you anything about your viewpoint. But you could also associate with all the nodes. This is what you'd have to do if you did computer graphics. You'd associate with all the nodes a viewpoint. So this is a structural description. And associated with each node now, we have the relation between the node and the viewer. That is, if you think in computer graphics terms, the coordinate transform between the int intrinsic frame of reference of the node and the intrinsic frame of reference of the camera. That's what RWV or RXV would be. And mental images, I claimed 40 years ago, um, were not like pixels. They were structural descriptions with viewpoint, associate, viewpoint information associated with them. I now think that's not entirely correct. So those slides are just to convince you that people really do use structural descriptions. They can describe the same image in quite different ways. And these structural descriptions make use of intrinsic coordinate frames and the relationships between these frames. Now, if you try and do that in a real neural network, if you're thinking about how the brain might do it, there's a problem, which is that every image has a different parse tree. In a computer with random access memory, that's no problem. You just create a graph for each image. You allocate some memory to each node in the parse tree, and you put pointers there to the other nodes, and everything's fine. But a real neural network can't do that. So I got very interested in whether these artificial neural networks can do parse trees in a way that's more plausible for a real neural network. And so the question is, if you have a neural network and it can't do dynamic memory allocation, it can't suddenly grab a bunch of neurons and say, you're gonna represent this. And of course, the reason it can't do that in a real neural network is because the knowledge of a neuron 
is in its connection strengths. And those connection strengths only change slowly. So you can't suddenly allocate a bunch of neurons to represent something on the fly. And so that's the question I'm going to be trying to answer. How can a neural network represent these PARS trees? And to do that, I'm going to combine three recent advances in computer vision. And I'll explain each of those advances, which will take about half the talk, and then I'll show how I combine them. So the first advance I want to talk about is the transformer, which is most impressive when it's applied to natural language, but can also be applied to vision. And transformers use something called attention. And attention differs from neural networks that came earlier, because attention is based on the scalar product of two activity vectors. So normally the way neural networks work is there's a vector of activities in a hidden layer, and then there's some incoming weights to a neuron in the next layer. Then you take the scalar product of an activity vector with a weight vector, and that's what's used to activate neurons. But transformers are different. The activation of neurons in transformers depends partly on the scalar product of two activity vectors. So this is an example of something before transformers. It's a convolutional neural network. It has many layers. And the idea is that at the bottom, you have vectors representing words. And as you go up through the layers, you refine the vector representation of each word by using context. So the vector that's third along, for example, might have been produced from the word may. And when you hear the word may, or when you see the word may in a sentence, it has several different possible meanings. Let's suppose we don't have capitalization, so that doesn't help us. It might be a month, it might be a modal, or it might be a woman's name. So the context will help you a lot with that. If nearby in the sentence you see words like should or could or might, that'll suggest it's a modal. If you see something like June, that will suggest it's um, a month. If you see the 13th of, that'll strongly suggest it's a month. So the idea is by using the neighboring words, you can disambiguate ambiguous words. And May can start off with a vector that sort of hedges its bets between the months and the modals and the women's names. And after it's looked around at nearby words, or after you've got information from nearby words, you'll get more confident that it's maybe a month in this particular sentence. So that will be how you do it with a convolutional, a one-dimensional convolutional neural net. A transformer does it somewhat differently. And it initially seems very complicated. Um, at the end of the talk, I'll make transformers a lot simpler, but I need to explain how they work now. So in the transformer, we're doing the same thing. We have multiple layers of representation of each word. And I'm just focusing now on the third word along. And what that word does is it has an embedding that is a vector that represents the meaning of the word. And to begin with, it's hedging its bets between multiple meanings. And from that embedding, it produces three other vectors via a neural net. And the neural net could have hidden layers in it. And these are called the query vector, the key vector, and the value vector. Now, the query vector is used, it's compared with the key vectors of other words nearby to see if other words are kind of relevant to this word. So for example, if it thinks it might be a month, it could put out a query that said, do we have any words that look like dates nearby, um, that look like the other bits of dates, like the 13th? And maybe the next word is the 13th. We'll make that one word to make life simple. And that word has a key that says, I'm, I'm, I could be part of a date. And so when the query matches the key, then the neighboring word will send its value to the word we're trying to disambiguate because the query matched the key. And so when you try and disambiguate a word, you're not looking at all other words with equal weights. You're saying there's other things in this sentence that might disambiguate me. And some of them 
are a good match. Some of them have keys that match my query and I'll pay a lot of attention to them. And others have keys that don't match my query and I'll more or less ignore them. And the way you pay a lot of attention to similar things is you first take the scalar product of the key and the query for all the other words in the sentence and then you exponentiate that. And then you normalize so the sum of all of them comes to one. And when you exponentiate, that means if you get a really good fit, you, you win big. And if you get a mediocre fit, you don't pay nearly as much attention to that. So that's a very quick introduction to how transformers work. And transformers have shown dramatic improvements in processing natural language. So one thing you can do with natural language is you can take a sequence of word fragments and try and predict the next fragment. And that's people have been doing that for a long time. But when you do it with transformers, it works better. Because when you try and predict the next fragment, you're looking around for what's relevant in previous fragments. Um, you can ignore some things and attend to other things. And that just gives you better representations of words and makes it predict better. Now, once you've trained one of these language models using transformers to predict the next word, one way of seeing what it believes or what it knows well, what it believes at least, is you give it a little sequence of words and then you say, okay, given that context, predict the next word. And then whatever, and what it'll do is it'll give you a probability distribution. So then what you do is you pick a word from that distribution according to those probabilities. So if it says there's a one in a hundred chance the next word is it, you pick it with a probability of one in a hundred. And you tell your language model you were correct. That was the correct next word. OK, what do you think comes next? And it gives you a distribution. You pick from the distribution and you say, yeah, this word from the distribution is what came next. Um, what do you think comes next? And so your language model keeps suggesting possibilities. You keep picking randomly, but according to those distributions. And the language model then will, will produce um, new text. And what's amazing is the quality of the text it produces. So I'm going to show you something that's now more than a year old. It's called GPT-2. There's GPT-3, which is much bigger, but GPT-2 is already amazing. Um, and it was a huge neural net at the time because it used one and a half billion weights. And so what I'm showing on this slide is a couple of sentences of text. And you give that to the language model as its context. And then you say, um, start predicting what comes next. And it predicts this. Now, this is just made up by the net. If you look on Wikipedia or on the data it's trained on, none of this is there. There's nothing called Ovid's unicorn. And there's nothing about silver white unicorns. Um, and there isn't a, a um, professor called Dr. Jorge Perez at the University of La Paz. They, it just made him up. But it's a pretty good thing to make up if you want to explain how come these unicorns speak English. And he went off exploring the Andes, according to this, and found a valley. And in that valley, they found unicorns. So it makes up a highly plausible story. And it's just amazing that it can make up stories about anything. And um, this is cherry picked, of course, but many of the stories are pretty good. OK, that's Transformers. And although they're normally applied to language, they can also be applied to vision. And more recently, people have been applying them to vision. I said this model uses 1.5 billion weights, and so it's a big model. But actually, that's not really a big model, not by real neural network standards. 1.5 billion weights is about the number of synapses in two cubic millimeters of cortex. You have nearly a million times as many weights. And so this language model that can make up fancy stories like that is not much more than a millionth of a brain in terms of synapses. I think it's a lot more than a millionth of brain in terms of ability. And that's because our brains may not use backpropagation and they're certainly not optimized for learning, um, for squeezing lots of information into a small number of synapses like 1.5 billion. They're optimized for learning a lot from not much data. And so they're probably much more redundant. So that's one of the ideas, transformers, where you decide what other things you're going to attend to based on some match between a query coming from you and a key that they have. 
The second new idea in vision that's made a big impact recently is contrastive self-supervised learning. And there the idea, which I actually introduced in 1992, um, but we didn't make it work that well, is you have two neural nets, they might have exactly the same weights in them, and you show these two neural nets two different patches of the same image. And what you'd like to do is make the outputs of the neural nets either be the same or be linearly related to each other. And the point is to try and find spatial coherence in images. So you say there's a lot going on in images, but the things I'm interested in are the things that are spatially coherent. And the way I'll extract those variables that are spatially coherent is by making the outputs that I get from two different patches be the same. That idea was taken up again by many groups more recently. I'll only mention one of the more recent models called Simcle, which was developed in Toronto, but there's lots of other models. And that's gonna be used for trying to extract representations from images that are good for classifying objects. And so the way it works is you take an image X and you apply some deformation to it. And the thing that worked best was to take two different crops of X. So take two different patches of X, quite big patches, possibly overlapping, but different. And also distort the color balance. If you don't distort the color balance, it's very easy to tell whether two patches come from the same image because they have the same color histogram. So it doesn't really need to understand much about what's in the image, it just says, do they have the same color histogram? If so, they come from the same image. So we're gonna mess up the color histogram so it can't do that cheap trick. And then having taken these two different patches from the image, we put each patch through a modern neural network, which has many layers of convolutions and identity mappings. Um, it's called a, a deep ResNet to get a representation. So from patch XI, we get representation HI. And from patch XJ, we get representation HJ. We then take each representation and we project it down to a smaller dimensional thing. And then we try and maximize agreement between those lower dimensional vectors, the Zs. And so it's the agreement between those vectors which we back propagate through the system. But if we just do that, if we just try and maximize agreement, what it'll do is make the Zs all be zero for all images. Every patch will map to zero and they'll say, look, we got perfect agreement. So what we meant by agreement was sort of significant agreement, not that everybody always says zero. And what we want is if you take two different patches from the same image, they produce similar Zs. And if you take two different patches from different images, they produce different Zs. So in addition to making the Zs the same if the two patches are from the same image, you need to also make them different if they're from different images. If they're already fairly different, you just leave them alone. But if they're from different images and they're quite similar, then you make them more different. So that's a very quick introduction to contrastive learning of representations. You're trying to make two patches from the same image have the same representation, and two patches from different images have different representations. And it actually works very well. It's a very good way of doing unsupervised learning. After you've done learning like this with deep neural nets, you have a representation for an image patch, and you can now try just keeping that representation and applying a classifier to it to see if you can tell what kind of object is in the image. And it works really well. If you use really big nets and do this, the performance you get from a really big net at classifying images is about the same as the performance you'll get from a smaller net if you train it with the labels. But the big net is trained without the labels. It only sees the labels when it just learns the last linear mapping to the outputs. So it's a, it, it's a really impressive way of doing unsupervised learning but it has something deeply wrong with it. And it's that thing that's wrong with it that I'm gonna try and fix. So suppose in one image, you, sorry, suppose in one patch, you have part of object of class A and part of object of class B. And in another patch from the same image, you have part of A, but you have part of a different object, class C, because they're different patches. 
Well, you don't really want those two patches to have exactly the same representation. What you want is for their representation of what's going on in object A, of class A to be the same, um, but for them to differ where one image sees B and the other image sees C. So I'm now gonna talk about an imaginary system. I want to build it, but I haven't built it yet, called GLOM. Um, it's GLOM because it agglomerates things. Um, and it's designed to overcome that problem with contrastive learning, that you don't really want two patches to be identical because they might have different things in them, even if they're in the same image. So the original motivation for this kind of contrastive learning of representations was to get agreement. And GLOM is going to try and get agreement between things, but only between things that satisfy the part whole hierarchy, as you'll see. Now, before I go further into the details of GLOM, I've got a disclaimer. The outer loop of vision is actually a sequence of intelligent, intelligently chosen fixations that sample the incoming optical information and give you the information required to perform a task. It's always goal directed. And that's why magic works. What magicians do is misdirect you so you don't sample the relevant information. And actually we think we see the whole world but we're doing an awful lot of sampling. Um, and we never process most of the input in high resolution. Now for each fixation, we reuse the same neural network to produce a multi-level -re representation of what arrives on the retina on that fixation, but then we make a different fixation. And this talk is only gonna be about what happens on the first fixation. I want to avoid all the complexity of sequential control in vision. I just want to talk about what happens in a forward pass on the first fixation when you have no, no prior context. So I can ignore time and just concentrate on processing one image. I'm also gonna assume that the image is at uniform resolution, which isn't right at all, but that also simplifies things. So if you think how you might represent part whole hierarchies, the obvious way if you do symbolic AI, or if you're a computer scientist, is to say, okay, I wanna represent a parse tree. It's different for every image. I'll set aside some neurons to represent each node in the image, and I'll give those neurons pointers to the other nodes in the parse tree, um, or use some other fancy method like a hash table for connecting them. Um, but these things involve dynamic allocation of memory. For about the last five years, I've been trying models that haven't worked out too well called capsule models. They sort of work, but it's been a lot of effort. And what they do is they say, well, if a neural net can't do dynamic allocation, we better allocate pieces of neural hardware in advance to all possible objects and parts of objects in all possible regions. It's not quite as bad as you might think because for complex objects like faces, um, you can just allocate one capsule for quite a big region because you never have lots of faces in a small region. Um, and then the idea is for each image, you activate one of these capsules. It's sitting there with all its knowledge just waiting to be activated. You activate it and you dynamically hook it up with other capsules. So you have connections that can be switched on or off. And so there's a process called dynamic routing which creates a graph structure out of these capsules which are already sitting around by activating them and connecting them. And you can get that to work for understanding images which are fairly simple images but it doesn't, it doesn't compete with convolutional networks for big images. GLOM is a, yet a third way of doing it. And what GLOM's gonna do is it's gonna use islands of agreement to represent the parse tree. What I mean by that will become clear soon, but it doesn't require any dynamic allocation. There's a biological inspiration for GLOM. So every cell in your body has a complete set of instructions for how to make proteins. So a brain cell has instructions for how to be a liver cell, which seems crazy, um, but biology can afford to be redundant. It doesn't take much energy to duplicate DNA. And so every cell can afford to have all the instructions. And there's a huge advantage of that from the point of view of parallelism. 
whatever it is the cell wants to do, it's got the instructions right there inside it. It doesn't ever need to go and consult anybody else. Um, the environment of a cell is going to determine which proteins it expresses. And so cells differ in their vector of protein expression levels. Now within an organ, the vectors of protein expression levels are pretty similar. And within some particular little bit of an organ that does some particular function within that organ, the vectors will be very similar. So the idea is that these vectors of similar protein expression in an organ are gonna be like objects. The analogy with vision goes like this. Locations in the image are like cells. We're gonna tie our hardware to locations in the image. And if you look in the brain of animals, locations in the pathway that does object recognition are always, the cells are always dedicated to particular parts of the visual field. They're retinotropic. The weights of the neural network are obviously like the DNA. And the vector of neural activities of all the cells that look at the same location in the image is like the vector of protein expressions in a cell. Now, there's a distinction that people ought to have been making and people don't make this distinction and they get very confused because they don't, they confound two things. They confound layers of a neural network with levels of representation. And I've done it myself in the past. So normally when someone explains to you how a neural network works for vision, they say we have these layers and in the low level layers, we represent low level things like edges. And in the high level layers, we represent high level things like objects, okay? I'm gonna make layers and levels be completely different types of things. So in GLOM, we're gonna have locations, which might be an individual pixel, but it'll probably be a bigger patch than that. And each individual location is gonna have an embedding vector, like we saw in transformers for a word. And as you go through the layers of the network, that embedding vector is gonna get refined. So just as the word may was initially rather ambiguous and then it got refined as you went through the transformer network for natural language, it's gonna be the same for vision. A location is gonna have an initial embedding vector and that's gonna get refined as you do a forward pass through the network. But the embedding vector to location is within the vector is gonna have multiple levels of representation. And actually they do this in transformers too. They have what are called multiple heads, which are multiple pieces of the representation of a word. So this is best understood with a picture. So this is basically the theory. The idea is that we have locations. We dedicate hardware to locations. What I'm showing you here is three different layers of the forward pass through the network. So neural activity is gonna go from one embedding layer to the next. Between the embedding layers, you might have a little neural network which has some hidden layers. I'll call those non-coding hidden layers. So the embedding layers are gonna be doing the representing. And in each location, in each layer, the embedding will have multiple pieces which correspond to different levels in the part whole hierarchy. So if you look at location three in layer n minus one, it will have a vector in the top box, which is the scene level embedding for location three. It'll have a vector in the next box, which is the object level embedding, and a vector in the next box, which is the part level embedding. So if you're looking at a scene with some faces, it might be that a face is the object level and a part level is something like a nose or a mouth. And initially for location three, those embeddings won't have all got sorted out. There'll be a mess and you won't know what should be happening. As you go through the layers, what we want is for it all to get sorted out. So if location three happens to have a nose, What's gonna happen is after, some, after you've gone through some layers, then at the part level, you'll have a vector for location three that represents that it's a nose. And any other locations that are also parts of that nose um, will have the same vector. 
at the object level, you'll have a vector that represents which face it's part of. And any other location that's part of the same face will have that very same vector at the object level. And at the seam level, um, they'll presumably all have the same vector because they're all part of the same seam. But you have to decide what that seam vector is. It's not just the same, it's a question of what it is. So the way in which this is going to deal with the parse tree is by using islands of coherence. So this is showing you for, let's say, six different locations, what the embeddings look like. And of course, these are high dimensional embeddings that contain information about what kind of thing the part or object is and what its pose is relative to the camera and so on. I'll just represent them as 2D vectors because that's all I can draw conveniently. At the lowest level, each location will have some different embedding. You'll then transform that. And at the subpart level, you might have pairs of locations that agree on what their embedding is because they found, um, let's say, a nostril or the bridge of a nose. At the next level up, those three red vertical arrows might correspond to different locations within a nose. And the three green arrows might correspond to different locations um, within a mouth. And what's tying them together is not that I created a node and gave that node pointers to all of them. It's simply that they have the same activity vector. Okay, so we're using identity of activity vectors to show what goes with what, to define how things are bound together. At the next level up, if the nose and the mouth are in the right spatial relationship, then we'll get a vector for the object that's the same for all those locations. So the thing to get from this, this picture is how the parse tree is represented by the identity of activity vectors. At the object level, you can see all those locations are part of the same object because they have the same vector. At the part level, three locations are part of one part and three locations are part of another part and so on. So certainly by using identity or near identity of the activity vectors, we can represent a parse tree. We can also represent more complicated things with disconnected parts. Now I want to talk about the interactions between levels because these are where it gets complicated. Um, in a transformer that has multiple heads, all the heads interact with each other at each level. But here I want to say that levels only interact with neighboring levels. And that's what's going to make them be sensible levels of representation in a part whole hierarchy. So if you think about the level L embedding at location X, it's going to depend on the embeddings in the previous layer. So we've got the location X, we've got the level L embedding, and it's in layer N plus one, let's say. It's going to depend on what all the embeddings are in layer N as we go through this forward pass, because that's the layer below it. There's going to be a bottom-up contribution from the level below in the previous layer, level L minus one. So let's consider the face. If there's a nose that's being represented at level L minus one in the previous layer, the nose can make some predictions about what face it might be part of. If you know the scale and orientation and position of the nose, and you know something about faces, you can figure out the approximate scale and orientation and position of the face. So parts at level L minus one can make predictions about the pose of things at level L, the orientation, scale, position, and so on. They can also make predictions about the type of them. If it's a nose, you expect the thing at the next level to be a face. Similarly, if we have a mouth at level L minus one, that can also make predictions. <coughs> and what we're interested in is if those predictions agree, then we probably have a face at the next level. So the nose and the mouth will be in different locations, but we're now gonna be very interested in whether the bottom-up predictions from different locations agree with one another. 
similarly, there's going to be a top down contribution from the layer below. This sounds strange to people used to neural nets that the layer below is giving a top down contribution. But that's just because people confuse layers with levels. At the layer below, which happens early in the forward pass, there's representations for high level things. And those representations for high level things can make top down predictions. So there may be something at the level of a whole person at the layer below at level L plus one that's making a prediction for where a face should be. So that would be a top down prediction. And finally, the predictions coming from the layer below also include predictions from the level L representation of other things at the same level, but in different locations. So a picture will help with all this. I know it's all very complicated. These slides will be on the web in a week or so. Um, and so you'll be able to go over it again if you're still interested. So here's a picture. This is for a single location, let's call it X. And what I'm showing you at the bottom is the embeddings at three different levels of whatever's in location X in layer N. And then at the top, you're seeing the embeddings of the next layer. And the embedding at level L in the higher layer gets a contribution from the level L minus one embedding at the layer below. So the level L minus one embedding might say, I think I'm a nose, in which case the level L embedding should be a face. And what's more, I can tell you something about the face. I can tell you a, quite a lot about the pose of the face. So that's how the bottom up interactions work. The top down interactions are a bit more tricky. And the reason is the level L plus one embedding that says, for example, I'm a person, and I know something about the pose of the person, so I can tell you where the face ought to be. Um, it's the same person. Uh, actually, I'll do it with I'll do it with um, faces and noses. Let's suppose the level L plus one is a face, and the level L is going to be a nose now. The level L plus one knows it's a face, but I want to use exactly the same face vector for all the different locations that are part of a face, because that's how I'm going to know they go together as part of the same face. But if I'm using exactly the same vector, how can that possibly predict in some locations a nose and in other locations a mouth? And the answer is my top-down neural net that looks at the level L plus one embedding in the layer below also takes as input a representation of the location. And if you know the location, you can figure out whether it's going to be a nose part of the face or a mouth part of the face. So when the face vector makes a top down prediction, you use an implicit function. Um, that's something that takes as argument the location you're predicting. And that's the third new idea in computer vision that's been very fruitful in the last couple of years, the use of implicit functions in, in computer graphics. So if you wanted to, for, for example, predict an image from a code vector, you could try and make a neural net that takes the code vector's input and predicts the intensities of all the pixels in the image. Or you could make a neural network that takes the code vector's input and it takes the coordinates of a pixel as input. And from the code vector puts the pixel coordinates, it predicts the intensity of that pixel. So let me show you a very simple example of that, a very toy example of an implicit function. Suppose I have four neighboring pixels in a row, and suppose the intensities of the pixels is changing linearly. So the intensity of location is of the form AX plus B. But suppose I think those pixels all go together as part of the same thing, and so I want them all to have exactly the same code vector. At the level of whatever kind of subpart that is, I want them to have exactly the same vector. But they're all different intensities. Well, the way I give them exactly the same code vector is I give them the coefficients of that equation as their code vector, 
And then my decoding neural network takes A and B, it takes the location whose intensity you'd like to predict, and it combines A and B with that location to produce the correct intensity. So now you see how the very same code vector at different locations can predict different things for those locations. It's because the top-down predicted model gets to see the location as well. If you think in a bit more detail about how the object level embedding vector for a face can predict nose vectors for some locations and mouth vectors for other locations, what the object level embedding vector has to contain is the pose of the face. And now when I tell you the pose of the face, that is the relationship between its intrinsic frame of reference and the camera, you can now predict um, whether some location should be a nose part or a mouth part if you're told what that location is. And so it's by using implicit functions that we can get away with using exactly the same vector to predict what's at many different locations. So that's the bottom up and top down interactions. The interactions between things at the same level, that's how you interact with things at different locations. And in a transformer, what happened was you would make up a query, you'd match it to keys elsewhere, and then those other locations would affect you depending on the match of the query to the key. Here, we're going to take the actual embedding and it's going to be the query, the key, and the value. We're going to make all those three things the same. This makes transformers much simpler. And what we're going to say at each location is that um, the influence you get from other locations at the same level is just going to, you're trying, going to try and match them in proportion to something that's the exponential of your scale of product with what's at those other locations. So if there's, if there's another location Y that's very similar to me, that's going to have a very big effect in trying to make me like Y. If there's another location Y that's very different from me, that's going to have no effect on me. So that's going to cause the level L embeddings to tend to form islands of similar embeddings. The whole system can be trained as a deep autoencoder. That is, you put in an image with missing regions, and at the output, you'd like the bottom level embedding, but at the top layer, to be the same image but with the missing regions filled in. That's how they train um, language models like BERT, which are based on transformers. But if you do that by itself, it won't necessarily lead to islands of similar embeddings. So you won't get an explicit representation of the part whole hierarchy. We can get that by adding contrastive learning. So if you think about for a level L, the predictions coming from the layer below, there's a bottom up prediction, there's a top down prediction coming from the adjacent levels. And then it's trying to agree with other vectors at the same level. And when you combine all three sources of information, the bottom up, the top down, and the other things at the same level, you get a consensus embedding which is a weighted average of all of those. Now, if you train it to make the bottom-up prediction and the top-down prediction, try and agree with the consensus embedding, what's going to happen is it's going to try and make the bottom-up and top-down predictions agree with the predictions at neighboring locations or at nearby locations or at locations that have similar embeddings. And so that's going to cause it to try and make bottom-up and top-down predictions agree at nearby locations. I'm almost done. You might think it's very wasteful to have these many different representations of the same object at all the locations within an object. We've got this object level vector replicated many times. And after the whole thing settled down, after you've done the whole forward pass, it does seem wasteful to have repl replicas of all these vectors. But when you're doing the search, when you're going through this forward pass and trying to figure out which embeddings should be similar to which other embeddings and what those embeddings should actually be, then having all this duplication is really helpful. It provides you with all the places where you can make hypotheses. <laughs>
So a location can hedge its bets about which other locations it goes with, how to group it. And as you go through the four paths, it's actually creating these clusters. And I haven't got time to go into this, but creating clusters works better than discovering them. Um, the other reason why replicating object embeddings is not as bad as you might think is because if you want long range interactions, then you want those long range interactions to be at high levels. So you want high level embeddings to interact with each other at quite distant locations. But you can't afford to interact with all those distant locations. So you're going to have to pick a sparse subset of them. But it turns out that's fine if what you expect to see at those other locations is big islands of identical vectors. You just have to hit one of them to see if there's something that you should try and be similar to that. So when you do have these big islands, you can use much sparser connectivity. So. I just want to summarize what I've said because it's complicated. I tried to explain three important advances in neural networks. That's transformers, contrastive self-supervised learning, and implicit functions for graphics. And I tried to show you how you might combine those three advances to solve the problem of how to represent part-whole hierarchies in a neural net so that you get visual representations that are like the ones we use. Now, Almost nobody else is actually interested in solving the problem of how you represent part whole hierarchies without doing dynamic storage allocation. I think they should be, because I think they should be interested in how people work, but most people in AI are not. Um, the main idea in this talk is complicated. In a week or so, um, I'm hoping the talk will be on the web. And in a few weeks, I'll put an archive paper that um, is the content of this talk. I'm now done. Thank you very much, Professor Hinton, for giving a sneak peek into your current ongoing thoughts. Perhaps we have seen one of the next big things that is coming in neural networks. Uh, I'm sure if it was a physical venue, it would have been a large round of applause at this point in time, but I would request everybody to give a virtual applause to you uh, for your wonderful talk. Thank you. We do have a few questions. Uh, I'll try to apply some agglomeration and try to relate the questions together so that uh, they're meaningful. Uh, starting with a couple of clarification one. Um, uh, so there were questions on uh, from Sugam. Um, uh, are these locations interacting with each other? And in, in because in transformers, different time steps do interact with each other. And the related question was that, how do we determine the locations in an image? I mean, and these questions came around the three layer slide that you were showing about objects, scene object part uh, that time. Yes. So. Let me answer the first one first, and then you'll have to remind me of the second one. Um, so yes, the locations interact, but they interact in a much simpler way than in transformers. So within a location, there's complicated interactions, but uh, of adjacent levels in successive layers. Those bottom up and top down neural nets are quite complicated nets because they need to do coordinate transforms. They need to do things like take the pose of the nose and predict the pose of the face that it's the nose of. The interactions between embeddings at the same level, they're like the interactions in a transformer. They're between different locations. And as you get to higher levels, they're over much longer ranges. But they're much simpler than a transformer because the query, the key, and the value are all identical. So they're actually simply just trying to average things. But it's an attention-weighted average. That is, you're trying to be similar to other things that are already similar to you. It's kind of like American politics. Um, and it will lead to whole bunches of more or less identical views that are very unlike other identical views. And that's what we want in this case. Um, okay. So tell me the second part of the question again. Uh, the second question from Arjun was, how do we determine the locations in an image? OK. so. The idea here is you would say, take an image and divide it up into patches of say eight by eight. And maybe it was an image of 256 by 256, divide it up into eight by eight patches. Those are the locations. Okay. Now, okay. if you're okay. really ambitious, you can make them pixels, but for now they'll just be patches. And people have done transformers like that. 
to make transformers work on images, you have to do tricks like that. Okay. Otherwise, there's too many pixels. Mm -hmm. Yep, makes sense. Um, so there are questions on the agreement, the notion of agreement. Uh, so there's a question on that. Could there be disagreement at higher levels, but agreement at lower levels? For example, two related people could have similar facial features, but are different people. Okay, so, right. So if the two people are both in the same image, then it's tricky. Um, if, they're in, if they're in different images, you'll get vectors for them that are fairly similar, but not identical. Mm -hmm. So you'd expect sort of twin, non-identical twins, maybe, to have pretty similar vectors. They're going to be the mm -hmm. same race and the same age and so on. Um, and I suppose they're the same sex already. And um, if they're both present in the same image, then there is the issue of, at a higher level, is there going to be kind of one object that involves both of them? Um, and yes, that's called a pair of people. Okay. okay. And so you might, at a higher level, have a pair of people, and this pair might actually have exactly the same vector for both people. But now when you write, construct one person or the other person, you're using different locations, and so your neural net knows to do things in different locations. Mm -hmm. So the exact same vector would say that this is a pair of people, and it'd tell you something about the left member and the right member of the pair, that would be in the vectors for both members of the pairs, they'd be identical still. But when you use the location information to now try and extract one of them, it would be able to extract the left one or the right one. Yep. Makes sense. Yep, uh, I, I think that is, that is clear. Um, so moving on to the next question uh, from Gautam, what makes different parts of an embedding actually separate into different levels automatically? Okay, so I'm wiring some of that in. I'm wiring it in by only allowing adjacent levels to interact. And also by putting in the, the lowest level of embedding would come straight from the image. You might apply a convolutional net to the patch, or you might just give it the patch. So the lowest level of embedding is gonna be very close to pixels. And you'd expect those embeddings to vary a lot as you go from location to location not to be identical for neighboring locations, unless you're in some big blank area. Um, mm. As you go to higher levels, because you've gone through more neural networks that are trying to make things similar, you're gonna be able to get similarity based on more and more abstract characteristics. So consider the similarity of the different locations in a face. There's nose locations and mouth locations. And at the face level, they have the same vector representation. And to, to see that they could have the same representation, you have to go through these intermediate levels. You couldn't see that they should be the same straight from the raw pixels. You have to realize mm -hmm. there are a nose and a mouth first. So that's going to help in making higher level things be at higher levels. And this island growing objective of trying to make the predictions agree with the consensus, it's going to have more effect as you get to higher levels so that you'd expect higher levels to have bigger islands of identity. But this would all be much more convincing if I actually implemented the system and it worked. Mm -hmm. Sure. So there is a question on the implementation. I'll come to that. But before that, I think this is a related one to the explanation that you just gave from Manish. Uh, should we include some sort of regularization at each level um, or at each layer to ensure that a limited number of objects get discovered in some sense to force nearby locations to agree? I'm not sure about that because you might after all um, have an image in which, I mean, suppose I have an image which has 300 little circular dots in. That's it, there's 300 objects there, and they're very small. So I want to allow a lot of flexibility. So I don't want to sort of, although I'd like it that islands tend to get bigger as you go up the levels, I don't want to build in a strong prior about how big they should be. 
Okay, okay, sure. Um, Professor Hinton, I know it is right at the top of the hour at midnight for you. Uh, I, there are quite a few questions. I was wondering if you, uh, we can continue for another five, seven minutes. Sure, sure. Great. Uh, so one question about the implementation uh, from Nishant. Uh, his comment is first, all parts of the GLOM architecture appear familiar. What part do you think is tricky to implement? I think um, the part where we try and get the bottom up and top down predictions to tend to cause islands of identity at nearby locations by trying to agree with the consensus, which comes from already trying to agree with other things nearby that you look similar to. Okay. So the bit where we try and create a real echo chamber um, in the social media sense, where everybody's gonna agree with everybody else, um, so what's happening in the echo chamber, which I've just, I realized during this talk, an echo chamber is a great analogy for this. What's happening in an echo chamber is you read other people's tweets and you change your views to be more like their tweets. Okay. So that's what Trump's doing with his tweets, right? He's not conveying facts. He's just showing you the things you ought to try and tweet if you want to be Trump-like. And it works very well. So I think okay, that part's that's... going to be tricky to get working. And then the other part that's tricky is the representation of the coordinate transforms in the bottom up and top down neural nets. They have to do something quite complicated, which is there has to be information about the pose in the object vector. And that information about the pose plus the location of where you want to fill in a part vector has to tell you the pose of the part. And so you're doing coordinate transforms. And what's more, what the coordinate transform is between the hole and the part depends on what kind of hole it is. So it's going to be quite a complicated neural network, more complicated than what the people doing implicit functions have done so far. Not that much more complicated, but more complicated. And it's going to be hard to get that one from too. So to okay. summarize, all the parts are going to be tricky. OK, sure. With an interesting analogy, thank you. Uh, there is one question uh, on Sinclair from Anand. Uh, so in Sinclair, there are some patches which are less different and there are patches which are fully different. So treating them as equally, I mean, difference wise, won't make sense. What are the possible solutions for this? Okay, so I think the best solution to it is to use attention. So in most of these contrastive learning things, not all of them. Very recently, Efros and some of his collaborators have done something over time that uses something like attention. But um, what you want to do is say, I found stuff in this patch, and it's already quite similar to what I found in some other stuff that I found in this other patch. So I'm going to make those things more similar. But I find other stuff that's different from what's in this other patch. So I want to make those less similar, or certainly I don't want to make them more similar. So rather than just saying everything in this patch should be similar to everything in that patch, you say things in this patch that are already similar to things in that patch should be made more similar. And if they're already just similar, they shouldn't be made more similar. So that's basically a tension weighting of this desire to agree. Agree with things you already agree with, not with things you don't agree with. So you have an attentional gating on that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, got it. Uh, maybe one more question. Uh, so this is actually an yeah, interesting angle to the, uh, how do we verify the semantics of part whole hierarchies with neural networks? So this comes from an anonymous attendee. I think, and this is my interpretation that I think he's probably referring to something like meronymy relation in WordNet, like the part whole relationship. Uh, and, and with the explanation, like if the whole is destroyed, then so are the parts. I mean, is there an analogy to that uh, that part whole concept here? You have to distinguish carefully between the in conventional AI, what's called the is a hierarchy and the part whole hierarchy. Yes. So in WordNet, it's all about the is a hierarchy. It's about mammals, a kind of animal, and an elephant's a kind of mammal, and an Indian elephant's a kind of elephant. That's the is a hierarchy, not the part whole hierarchy. You could call it part whole for classes, but 
really it's the is a hierarchy versus the part whole hierarchy, which is um, my nose is part of my face. The nose is part of a face. A nose isn't the same kind of thing as a face, it's part of a face. A nose isn't a kind of face, it's, a, it's part of a face. It's very different from the is a hierarchy. Um, so now could you repeat the question in light of that? Okay. Just give me a second, I'll just scroll down. How do we verify the semantics of part whole hierarchies with neural networks? Uh, okay, so the idea would be, if this works, after you've trained the network, you look for these islands of agreement. And these will be regions it's segmenting together. And these regions get bigger as you go further up the network. And you see if they correspond to the natural part whole hierarchy. You also see if the same neural network can get different parses of the same image, depending on random things or how you initialize it because you'd like to show that it can get two alternative parses of the same image. Like I showed you with that, that set of six rods. You can see those six rods with two different groupings. And you'd like that to be, to be real in a neural network. So I'd like to be able to see a neural network that can get, you see a convolutional net can't do that. A convolutional net isn't gonna get two different interpretations of the same image. Mm -hmm. Sure. I, I think, I mean, there were quite, um, quite a few other questions, but I think the representative ones are covered. And uh, so, and we are already seven minutes over time. So I would like to thank you one more time, Professor Hinton, for giving us this, uh, this uh, maybe fresh from the oven talk and very, very, uh, very recent, very current, at least I haven't seen this. I mean, I have seen quite a few videos of yours, but I haven't seen your, this work. Uh, but uh, we, are, we really, really appreciate it. And especially, I know it's quite late for you, but thank you very much. It was, a, it was a pleasure and honor to host you. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. And thank you for the questions. All of those questions were very useful clarifications. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, audience. Thank you, Professor